be seated. Now, the first time I read this um, gospel today, I was just as confused as those guys that were hanging out with Jesus were. It didn't make any sense to me whatsoever. I had to delve into it for a while before it finally fell into place. But Jesus was looking beyond the present to the new age, which was to come. And he, when he does that, he's using a conception deeply rooted in ancient Jewish thought. The Jews believe that all time was divided into two, two ages, the present and the age to come. The present age was wholly bad and wholly under condemnation. And I don't mean wholly H-O-L-Y, W-H-O-L-L-Y, bad, just not good. But the age to come was the golden age of God. And in between those two ages, preceding the coming of the Messiah, who would bring in the new age, there lay the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord would be a terrible day. And the world would be shattered into fragments before the golden age would dawn. The Jews were in the habit of calling the terrible between time the birth travail of the days of the Messiah. The Old Testament and the literature written between the Testaments are both full of pictures of this terrible between time. See, the day of the Lord come cruel with wrath and fierce anger to make the earth a desolation and to destroy its sinners from it. That is from Isaiah. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of thick darkness from Joel. The day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, and the elements will be resolved by fire, and the earth and everything that is done on it will be burned up. And that comes from the New Testament from Second Peter. But such was the picture of these birth twangs that were coming at the coming of the Messiah. Now Jesus knew the scriptures, and the pictures were in his mind and in his memory. And now he was saying to his disciples, I'm leaving you, but I'm coming back. The day will come when my reign will begin, and my kingdom will come. But before that, you will have to go, these, go through these terrible things with pain, like birth pains, upon you. If you faithfully endure these blessings, you will be very precious, and the blessings will be precious. Then he went on to outline the life of the Christian that endures. And he told them six things. For once the day of the Lord comes, and after that in the new age, the sorrow will turn to joy. There will be a time when it looks as if to be a Christian brings nothing but sorrow. And to be of the world brings nothing but joy. That the day will come when the roles are reversed. The world's careless joy will turn to sorrow and the Christian's apparent sorrow will turn to joy. Christians must always remember when their faith costs them dear that this is not the end of things. And sorrow will give way to joy. And it makes me think about all of the disciples and the early Christians who suffered greatly for their beliefs. Many died. And then again we see, and I think God was very bright when he put in to the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not covet. Because each of us at times... We have to admit it. We get a little jealous of people that you see they just were born with a silver spoon in their mouth. And they have everything. They don't have to work for anything. And we work and we look. And we sometimes resent that. And we think that's not fair. But Jesus said that all will reverse itself. There will be two precious things about the Christian joy. One, it will never be taken away. It will be independent of the changes and chances of the world. You see, the joy which Christ gives is independent of anything the world can do. It will be complete. 
And life's greatest joy, there's always something lacking. And Christian joy, the joy of the presence of Christ, there is no tingle of imperfection. It is perfect and complete. I once had a job that I made a lot of money in. It was a very prestigious job. And everybody in that that surrounded that looked up to me and the other people who did this. But you know what? One day I decided life was just not complete. It did not bring true joy. It brought money and everything money can buy, but there was something lacking. I had been, God had been tapping me on the shoulder since I was about 13 years old. And I didn't pay much attention to it. I thought about it a little bit, but I didn't pay much attention to it. And then I finally, he tapped me on the back. And I told my priest, he had come to my office. We were getting ready to build a $6 million building. From scratch, we were two years old. And he came to see the plans, and I had them in the conference room at my office. And he said, you know, this is wonderful. You're doing a good job. And I'm thinking, wait, wait, before we do that, I think God is calling me to the priesthood. He said, I kind of wondered about that. Okay. So he said, well, I have a, this was on a Friday afternoon. I have a wedding tomorrow. And, of course, Sunday is full of Sunday stuff. And I'm off on Monday, but I will call the bishop, and you and I both will go see the bishop to get you started to be a postulate for holy orders. He was 39 years old, and the next day he dropped dead. So I put it all on the back burner. And then when I was 52 years old, I had a massive heart attack and had to be rushed into surgery. And when I came to, we had our priest had just retired that week, or the week before that, and I was there with Beth. When Beth came into the ICU where I was, I still had an endotracheal tube in me. I'm strapped down and paralyzed. I can't move. And there's this priest I didn't know, and I thought, uh-oh, you should have listened. <laughs> but anyway, he was the new interim priest we had in it while I was recovering. He would come every day, and we would talk. He never did a set of word to convince me that this is what I was to do. But I did it, and after I recovered, I started my walk in faith. And that's when I realized that the joy that Jesus can bring to each and every one of us is there. My life was no longer incomplete. I had a friend that I could talk to about anything. I had a friend that I could pray to if I needed to, but most of it was just conversations we had back and forth. And then he gave me a wonderful gift, which I have tried to take, and we and move forward. And the third thing he said was, in Christian joy, the pain which went before is forgotten. And he's right on the money. The mother forgets the pain when she has the wonder of that brand new baby in her arms. The martyr forgets the agony and the glory of heaven. I'm sorry that I read that wrong. He forgets the agony and the glory of heaven. But if a person's fidelity costs much, the cost will be forgotten at the joy of being forever with Jesus Christ. And before there will be fullness of knowledge, you don't have to ask me any more questions. You'll know the answer to everything. 
That's kind of neat because that priest friend of mine, he said he had a whole long list of stuff to ask Jesus when he got to heaven. And he didn't have to ask anything, did he? You see, in the life, there are always some unanswered. In this life, there are unanswered questions and unsolved problems that we can't completely deal with. For in this life, we have to walk by faith and not by sight. We must always be accepting of that that we cannot understand. But see, it's only fragments of the truth that we can grasp at times and glimpse of God that we must see. But in the age to come with Christ, there will be fullness of complete knowledge. So when the time comes and we're fully with Christ, the time of questions disappears. We have the answers at that point. Number five, there will be a new relationship with God. But when we truly and really know God, we're able to go to Him and ask for anything. Now, I know we all do that sometimes. Lord, I, you know, I, I need this, I need that. We did that when we were children, too. We know that the door was open. We know that his name is Father. We know that his heart is love. And what we are like children who never doubt that their father delights to see them or that they can talk to him as they wish. But Jesus said we can ask for anything, but if we think in human terms, the only terms that we have in this life... However, when children love and trust their parents, they know quite well that sometimes their parents will say no because their wisdom and their love knows best. But we can become so intimate with God that we may take everything to Him. But we must always end by saying, Your will be done. Now, I lost my, my hearing aids this morning. I can't hear a word you're saying, but I hope you can hear me. And I sent Beth to find them. Usually when I lose something, that I pray, and a picture of it pops into my mind, and I know exactly where it is. Now, that's, that's the relationship that God and I have. But I didn't ask this morning. I was hoping that Beth would ask so she could find them. <laughs> the new relationship is made possible by Jesus, only by Jesus. God has given us that new covenant that everything from this day on is going to be relationship with Jesus. It is in Him that our joy is indestructible, it's perfect. And our knowledge is complete. That the new way to the heart of God is open to us. And that all that we have comes to us through Jesus Christ. It is in his name that we ask and receive, that we approach and we're welcomed. So what Jesus is trying to tell his guys is, hey, I've got to go. My role here on earth is, is over with, but I'm still here with you. I leave with you the Holy Spirit, who's going to be your best friend. You can go to him with anything. But Jesus is the reason that all of this took place. The reason that he sits at the, the right hand of God Almighty is so that we know that he is at the very top. And he's there for us when we need him. And I once had a lady in church, she's sitting on the front row, 
and I was talking about the personal relationship that we should have with Jesus Christ. And this lady raises her hand, and she's going, Sir, can, can, can I interrupt you? And I said, Well, yes, I guess you can. She said, I've got a question. And I said, What is that? She said, Well, in my church, I'm not allowed to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Are you telling me that I can have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? I said, Yes, ma'am, that's what it's all about. She came back two months later, and she said, I don't know, I'm wrong that church. I'm wrong to yours. She was from England. And I thought that that was probably, somebody finally heard a sermon that I said. But I pray that each of you will take what Jesus is telling us and what he told his disciples and take that to heart so that each and every day you talk to him and you walk with him, as the song says. And all this I pray in his name. Amen.